like to acknowledge Pilch, uh, one of my favourite uh, non-government organisations. Mainly my favourite because they sound like a rude verb. Um, pilching sounds like the sort of thing you'd expect Alan Jones to be caught doing in a London urinal. But um, uh, and I don't really see my role as uh, a moderator of this discussion. I'm hoping it'll be kind of an inflamer and to try and just uh, lower the intellectual tone, a task that I feel peculiarly qualified to do. Um, uh, and I would just like, instead of acknowledging the traditional owners, to acknowledge my first employer as uh, a law firm, uh, Blake Dawson Waldron, uh, who, from whom I got many things. Um, mostly stationary, to be fair. <laughs> but also a few things that I've used along the way. Um, we've got about half an hour uh, to engage in a pretty freewheeling and open discussion that I would really like to uh, involve you guys in. Um, Jade and Mish are standing around the place. Uh, that's uh, Mish over there and Jade on the other side. So if you'd like to ask a question, just raise your hand. They'll come over to you with the microphone and we'll have a bit of a, a, a chat. Um, you're most welcome to do that anytime starting from now. Um, but while we're waiting for, for that to happen, I thought I'd just um, make one comment which I think uh, emerged as a theme from both Nick and Simon's uh, talks a and maybe open up a question to anyone here and to you guys. It seemed, it, the theme of both those talks seemed to me to be risk. Uh, the willingness to take big risks where you don't know the answer but where you're just willing to give it a go. And I've got to say, in my, for want of a better expression, career, moving away from law and the way you think as a lawyer has been very much about learning how to take risks. Uh, because I think, uh, and I suspect it's not true necessarily of people in this room, because I think this is probably a self-selecting group of uh, the, the exceptions who prove the rule of law, for want of a better expression. But, um, but I think that there might be a problem in the legal profession, which is a culture of risk aversion and narrowed thinking and a preponderance to think about the worst possible results uh, as a way of not taking action. Uh, and I think Simon's point is really interesting. It, it was incredibly engaging uh, to see that, that quite dramatic legal victory that GetUp had during the election campaign. And why don't we have more of it? Why, uh, you know, and, and it's interesting that it kind of happened um, as a result. Uh, it was like the last step in a process of trying to uh, conduct more conventional social change. So um, do you guys agree, Fiona, do you agree, to, do you guys agree that there is a problem in the way we train our lawyers uh, to be not cognizant of risk, because that's really sensible, but risk averse, uh, which I think can be a problem. It's just on. Is it on? Yeah. Am I on? Uh, and I'm, I'm going to jump in. I seem to have grabbed this first. Um, I think no. I think I mean I'm not a lawyer, but my but when I turn to lawyers, as I do every second day uh, for legal advice, I'm not looking for someone to push me to take risk. I'm looking for someone to talk me down out of my crazy idea, <laughs> or or to at least tell me what I'm actually risking in the first place. Yeah, we'll and take so the I, risk more cleverly. Exactly, exactly, a more informed risk. I don't think it's and I could be wrong, but I don't think the role of lawyers is to push clients to take risk. I think it's to offer an understanding of what uh, you're actually risking, what your chances might be, which is the eternal client question, which always gets a non-answer, uh, and, uh, and therefore leave it to the client to, to be taking more risks or to other organisations. So there is something going on, but I don't think it's necessarily lawyers who need to change to solve it. I certainly agree with that, by the way. Obviously, you can't, well, I mean, you can get instructions if you really want them, um, but you, you, know, you can't, uh, tell your clients how to act. But I do think that uh, where, the, where the legal profession works best, it's when people are being genuinely inventive, creative, uh, in ways that we're not necessarily trained to do and that it should be extended beyond the realms of tax avoidance uh, by trying to think of new ways to agitate um, uh, social issues. Um, and I wonder a lot of the time whether we're wasting the resources of, our, of some of our best legal minds by 
limiting that a little bit. But uh, do, do, Nick, do you have any comments there? Agree with you. So yeah, right. <laughs> Good. Get stuck into each have other. A fight here and encourage you. <laughs> do no, I, I get to respond? I, I think there's. Um, I disagree for a couple of reasons. One is that I think if I want legal advice, I want exactly what you said. But I think I'm not talking to lawyers, and I think we are a different group. You know, so mm. I'm thinking yeah. you're right about the self-selecting group. But when, I, I think I do want lawyers to not. I, I, I mean, we use quite a lot of lawyers in our business, and obviously used a lot of lawyers when I, the Brotherhood of Lawyers. I don't think I want. I'm, I'm bored of the conversation that you often have with lawyers, which is that my business, you know, my day-to-day -day job is really not giving me anything and I want to go and give back. I mean, Pilch's whole life is about that. So, I, and I kind of think to myself, well, why is that? You know, why is it that there isn't a strategy within your business? Why isn't it that you don't sit down? I mean, I sit down in my business and, you know, we, we decide what it is we're about as a business. And we don't do anything that isn't mass action on climate change. Now, it has to do some other things. One of the things it has to do is be profitable because nobody gives us any money. But we decide where we're going to place ourselves every single day. We're strategic about it, we're clear about it, and therefore we don't do shit things every day that dumb our mind. We never do shit things that dumb our mind. And yet, I speak to so many lawyers that say, you should be in my place, it's hard to get creative when you're doing what I'm doing every day then why are you there? I mean, I really, I, I think that's, so I, I want to go, yes, if I'm coming to you and I want this, I want you to numb me down and get me out of my crazy tree. But actually, I want to know which lawyer, and co which company to go to that actually on a daily basis is reflecting about the contribution they want to place in the world and the, and the kind of work that they want. And I think that's what I don't see. Which seems like a perfect opportunity for me to plug my wife's book, The Pinstripe Prison, about, uh, <laughs> uh, about uh, the culture of law firms and professional agencies. But um, uh, does, do we have a question? Yes. Uh, yes. Hi, I'm Evelyn. Um, I just wanted to kind of make a comment about the kind of chicken and egg scenario. Um, I was involved in starting the Human Rights Arts and Film Festival because I wanted to try and uh, make human rights something that's mainstream, something that people talk about because what I found was that people didn't, in Australia didn't really talk about human rights except for the little tiny group of lawyers at law school and, um, you know, who read it in books usually from another country. Um, and so I thought the only way to kind of get the mainstream talking about it was to start a festival and uh, use film and art to communicate human rights issues to a broader audience. Hopefully that would inspire people to learn about human rights and then when the question eventually came up in Parliament, as it has already, whether we should have a Human Rights Act, that it might push um, politicians to act in a certain way and actually implement human rights uh, legislation so that there is more opportunities for lawyers to actually be creative with the law and protect human rights through the law. It hasn't worked yet. And um, I'm finding it's quite difficult to figure out where should you, where should you start to try and keep that dialogue happening. You know, I suppose it's kind of, you know, you try to go through the traditional parliamentary means, the parliamentary processes doesn't kind of work, go through the kind of education means, that takes a very long time, is very hard to measure, um, and then you're kind of still in the law and the law is quite closed. So I suppose I just wanted to kind of hear your comments on that type of direction. Guys, any comments? Well, yeah, I've I, I got to say thank you very much to you, first of all, because this year you showed my brother's film, so he was very grateful. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and I, yes, I got to auction some things for you. Um, so, but but I but I, I think part of the point here is not that you you in this room don't do those things or go to Pilch or or don't aren't great and creating a really good opportunity. I think you are. I think the point is slightly a, a tougher one for you, uh, in my view, which is what. What other things, you know, go back to my, go back to that young woman on the steps, you know, is, is she dead? And could we have had a case that means that she isn't dead? I mean, I, 
and, and it wouldn't be, how difficult would it be for five of you to get together and actually say, as you did, hold on, there must be some things in here that actually people are not getting their rights and we could put together a class action and we'll go down to the drug and counselling centre and say, can you get me three really good looking plaintiffs that can speak, you know, in a way that's understood and will be not drugged up on the day that I need them? And if they say, yes, we can, why aren't you, why aren't you using your skill? I wrote a book. <laughs> <laughs> I bought it because it's called The End of Charity. So, I see, we're, in here we're talking about charity. I'm actually not interested in your charity, although it's very, a very valuable place for you to learn. I'm actually interested in your bloody skills as lawyers. Because that's where the contribution might best be. Now, it is extraordinary that in your spare time you want to go and create an art festival. I mean, great. What a great way to be around and, you know, thanks for the gig. But, you know, what are you doing as lawyers during the day? That, so it's a tougher question. Fiona, did you have a comment on that? Just my quick comment is that um, I think that the work of the arts festival and others is incredibly important. I think lawyers have a role to play in talking Simon off the ledge, but I think that we also can be very risk averse. And the reason why you don't get more lawyers doing the kind of stuff that Nick's exhorting us to is because we train ourselves away from that kind of thinking. So I do think, back to Julian's initial premise, it is something about the way we train law students. It's certainly about the way that the legal environment pushes you to think once you get into it. Uh, it's the fact that we talk to ourselves all the time about this kind of stuff and not to anybody else. We're never forced to try and communicate these um, ideas outside of our own cohort and we're no different to any other professional group in that respect. But it's why I think the, um, the Arts Festival is so, so important and please don't stop doing it. Um, we really do need to get people to see that this is not stuff that just excites lawyers but is actually really important to the kind of community that we want to be a part of and the kind of world we want to be part of. Mm. And the more people who are self-starting, doing uh, original inventive things that may or may not work, uh, the more people that are doing that increases the chances that there are going to be some spectacular successes um, which, which may change the world uh, and even the failures are glorious. Um, 